Wow. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marshall Dallas, and as Chief Executive of the Edinburgh International Conference Centre, I'm delighted to welcome you to EICC for this evening's Innovation Endurance. Now, we first, la we first launched our Innovation Nation Lecture Series in 2015 as a celebration of all things innovative that come out of Edinburgh and Scotland, and also to inspire a new generation of city ambassadors. In the last couple of years, we've welcomed uh, some of Scotland's most innovative thought leaders uh, to discuss a wide spectrum of topics from architecture and the arts to space travel and li-fi. These seminar seminars have all been free and open to everyone to attend. Now, EICC, we strive to be more than just a conference centre, uh, but a place that inspires ideas that can change the world. This is very much our vision, and Innovation Nation is an integral part of that. But I have to say that when uh, Innovation Nation was conceived two years ago, we never expected to see an audience quite as big as yours. <laughs> Nor did we expect to welcome a keynote speaker who has truly redefined limits of endurance to such an impressive extent. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the EICC. And please give a round of applause to our host for this evening, Claire English. Thank you. Hello. Oh my goodness, there are quite a lot of you out here. How are you doing? Great to be with you. It's a horrible night out there, isn't it? It's good to be in the warm. This is an inspirational event as well. It's going to be a warm, inspirational event. We are so lucky to have such a fantastic venue and a guest whose achievements are worthy of the epic scale of this place. I marvel at it and how you can cut bits out of it and make it smaller and make it bigger. But what an audience tonight. We are so glad that you came along and braved the disgusting weather. Um, on a very personal note, I'm delighted to finally meet someone I've seen, read and heard so much about over the past 10 years, maybe more than that. This man has uh, pedaled hard, put in thousands and thousands of hours of graft. I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that he lives and breathes commitment and determination. The achievements have been many, but surely there's been some cost to this, but we want to know, was it all worth it? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to find out tonight, but first let's check out this little film to whet the appetite. Ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to have him here in the flesh, along with the bike that's carried into his latest success and, and a very influential and inspirational woman in his life. Welcome, please, Mark Bowmans. <laughs> hey, come and sit down, come sit down, you know. Have a seat. <laughs> Well, that's a lovely welcome, but uh, you've noticed it. Uh, Mark, well, you'll do the introductions. Who is this person beside us? Absolutely. Well, many in the audience will 
who know a little bit about the backstory will, will, will recognize the lady to my left. She's known to most people um, as uh, Yuna, quite often referred to as Base Camp for all the... Base Camp. Base Camp. We're, we're the hub of all these mega expeditions, but uh, I know her as Mum. There you go. Mum, welcome. I think it's brilliant to have you here. <laughs> oh. Now, you know, it's no accident you're here tonight. Uh, you've played a, a pivotal part in my, Mark's life and in the team and running base camp. And obviously, you know him very, very well. You launched him into the world. So you, you've got an inside track on him that perhaps is going to be much more interesting to hear about than, than me just asking questions as well. And I'm sorry, I made, I made this poor woman come along because I just thought, this is really interesting, this dynamic between mother and son and the fact that you play such a big role in his life right now. But I'm just wondering about, I mean, he's used to this. He does all this stuff. He does broadcaster, adventurer, author, speaker. How are you feeling about sitting in a small stadium like this with a few close friends? Well, I was just going to say, surrounded by friends, family, pretty good. Pretty good. Thank you. Yay. Have you ever done anything like this before and no. talked about Mark in public? No. Are you likely to say anything indiscreet? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. The bike's here as well. Um, tell us about this bike because it's not that old, but it's done a lot of miles, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, this, this steed is about six months old. It's done about uh, 20,000 miles probably. So it's uh, had a short but tough life. One careful owner. It looks uh, good. And I mean, I only finished it about uh, eight weeks ago on the, the, the last mission, which is really a culmination of everything we've been adventuring at for the last 22 years and that was of course to, to try and get around the planet in 80 days. Which of course we're going to be talking a lot about later as well. When you look at that bike or you look at the bike, the bike that you're on, is it a love-hate relationship? Uh, no, I mean I think I'm quite practical about bikes. I'm not, I'm not actually that geeky about bikes. People are often disappointed to hear. I don't even know that much about bikes, I just ride them. Um, that, that sounds really flippant, but it's true though, isn't it? You really aren't interested in the... No, well, I mean, I, I, I understand them at the level I need to. I work with great teams to make sure they're the right tools for the job. But, I mean, I've got friends who name their bikes and uh, who can tell you every, every incredible detail. And I, I, I'm not that guy. I just, I just ride. What about you, you know, when you see the bike, does it remind you of what he's just <laughs> done, that 80 days or less than 80 days? Um, does it feel weird seeing it again, actually? on a stage and clean. Well, but to be fair, the home, mum's house is like a bike shop at the moment. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and many bikes. A, 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 an incredible amount of kit. And uh, so that's what base camp looks like. So mum's quite, probably quite happy that the bike's not uh, in the hallway at home at the moment. We were talking earlier and we were, we we're saying that it's really interesting that you are at this stage where you are an adventurer, you're described as an adventurer. But I mean, nobody writes that down as a job description or did you ever think, well, my son's going to be an adventurer? It, it's the stuff that life throws at you that makes you into an adventurer and that's the exciting thing, isn't it? It's a bit of a journey. Absolutely. It's, it's how it's evolved, um, you know, whether it was the environment that Mark was, you know, grew up in. I think that lends to, you know, the adventurous spirit coming out in him, but it was always there. And uh, yeah, it's just evolved. So not entirely a surprise to you how things have turned out. Maybe not the scale of what he's achieved, but the fact that he's gone on to do such things. Well, from when he was 10 and came and said, you know, he'd like to cycle John O'Groat's Land's End. Um, As you do when you're 10 years old, yeah. Uh, and, you know, Mark's always um, thought about things even at that stage, before he actually comes to you, you know, you know it's almost a done deal in his head, <laughs> and you're the last to hear, you know. And so I said, well, I, th I thought the only thing that he hadn't really reckoned on at that stage was the, the distance. So I said, how about across Scotland first? So the issue, I hadn't, I hadn't really cycled off the farm at that point. So it, it, was a, it was a bit of a, even though I'd got the car map out of the landy and highlighted the roads, um, I still, you know, as a... 10, 11 year old had no sense of scale. I just thought it sounded fun. But come on, you also had ambition and you thought, I can do this. And you really need to have that self-belief that, you know, you're not going to fold at the first hurdle. Yeah, and I, I mean, I've, I've never been a racer. I've, until recent years, I've not been coached professionally. You know, it's always been for the love of journeys as opposed to, you know, the want to be a professional athlete. I mean, that's happened in recent years because of the journey I've been on. But I mean, in those early days, you know, pedaling across Scotland with the help of mum and a friend, and then, you know, when I was 15, soloing John O'Groat's Land's End, 
the first 10 years that we should talk about, you sort of 12 to 22 to really leaving Glasgow Uni was, um, was just, you know, every summer holidays taking on bigger and bigger adventures. To be fair, you know, big sports growing up were more skiing and horse riding. Cycling only really came to the fore in my late teens. Quite surprising to hear, but you know, in an event like this, I'm just you know, innovation nation talking about people that inspire us. Do you feel that everybody has got it in them to do kind of what you've done in their own way? Yeah, I think I think very much in their own way because um, you know, not not every young person is going to have the same passion and interest I have. But when it comes to c creating a habit for you know being furiously busy at what's in front of you and not being intimidated by you know, people asking you what your five-year plan is, then, then I think you can absolutely instill that in anyone. Um, I was very lucky from an early age to have such freedom. I mean, I didn't go to school until I was 12. And, uh, you know, that, that meant that, you know, I was maybe around the kitchen table for a couple hours a day doing subjects. Uh, but the rest of the time, we were working on the farm. You know, there was... Um, well, there was 60 goats to milk. There was 13 horses to put out and muck out. There was... Uh, you know, lots of work to be done on the farm. And, you know, you don't question your childhood because it's all you know. But it's only now with a bit of perspective I realise that that was a, a pretty unique start. You know, it was quite a, I guess, quite a swallows and amazons existence. It was, it was just complete, complete freedom. Well, you're Argyll Peninsula, then rural Perthshire. That's where you were yeah. spending your formative years. So you had to get him educated. And you did it. You home educated him. <laughs> How did that go? Well, he's turned out okay, yeah. <laughs> I guess he's turned out okay, but what was it like? Because did you follow a curriculum or did you make it up? Uh, no, well, there was... Okay, so I had a very keen interest in the Montessori method. Explain and to so, people a, a bit about the sort of tenets of... of so Montessori is sort of... Uh, to, as a teacher, um, you, you present the environment, the whatever, and then you stand back. It's sort of learning to learn yourself. And so I, th I think that's, that was a very big lesson for me to be able to introduce and then stand back and let them explore. And whether it was around the kitchen table at um, the basics or whether it was out and about just presenting and seeing what they would do with it and stand back. And, and I, th I think that's still how I worked in a certain way because this is Mark's business, this is his path and I'm supporting him and I very much still, you know, let him run with it as it were and, you know, I'm there for him but, you know, he's running with it. We, we, we've never really sort of spoke about it on those terms but, I mean, because I didn't understand the methodology, I, just, I was just a kid but the, the um, I mean, that's the truth and what I often say is, you know, the, the reason we can work together, mum's greatest strength is she doesn't often wear the mum hat, um, which is incredible when you consider, you know, some of the, the ambitions and some of the risks and some of the, the things that we've taken on together over the last 10 years. You know, when we've been doing this professionally for 10 years and before that, you know, it was as a, as a student and as a, as a pupil at high school. So, you know, to, to, to always sort of not just accept the plan, I mean, very, very much working in collaboration, but always to accept the ambition and never to sort of say, no, Mark, I'm worried, you know, I don't want you to do that. And, and I'd say to, to play the mum card. That would be very, very difficult in a professional relationship, but mum's never done that. So it's interesting to hear you talk about, you know, that was the whole mindset with, with, with learning from an early was, age. Was it sometimes hard, though, to step back? Did you have to kind of train yourself to be like that? Because you strike me as being somebody that's very serene and very grounded. I, I've actually never had that challenge with Mark, with the girls. Two sisters, when, yeah, yeah, one older, one younger. Mar Mark's elder sister, when she announced she wanted to go off backpacking on her own, um, I found that bit of a challenge, you know, saying goodbye to her. I mean, I never stopped her. I never, I never said no, and I supported her with her plans, but I found that a real challenge. And then when I heard she was hitchhiking at the roadside <laughs> and jumping in lorries and what have you, I thought, this is quite tough. <laughs> There's some great pictures getting flashed up here. So which is which, then? Talk us through. So Heather is to the right. Of so she's the older one. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then Hannah. So he Heather's now an educational psychologist, and Hannah's studying midwifery. And so neither of them ever wanted to go off and do the absolutely. sort of things that. No, uh, um, absolutely. They've all got the, the free spirit. Um, Heather is a very keen um, rock climber and went off. Um, in fact, she she went to Thailand and then she was in New Zealand. 
she spent a few years in, in Stockholm. Um, yeah, she's a great mountaineer. She's good on the bike. She's a great adventurous spirit. Interesting. Bo both of the girls have, have lived abroad for a significant period of time, whereas I never have. Um, I've just spent the last 10 years traveling, but this has always been home. So um, I think the three of us have, have seen the world um, to you know, a, a, a huge amount, but in very different ways. And how much do you think where you grew up in a sort of rural setting where you could go off skiing if you'd finished your homework, yeah. is that right? You, could, you had those options. How much of that kind of predetermined that you were going to do something different, you weren't going to be doing a desk-bound job? Well, I mean, I, th I think the risk now, age 34, is to reverse engineer my life and say that that was, you know, that was evident okay. that was going to happen. But I, I don't think that's the case. I mean, there was definitely a lot of things which happened in the first two decades which, you know, gave me the skill set, the toolkit. But... I mean, for example, the next door neighbour was head of ski patrol and it was closer to Glenshee than it was to school. So, I mean, of course, I spent a, a good amount of time up there. Um, but, um, no, I, I mean, I went to Glasgow Uni and studied economics and politics and I was in a class of 300 and everyone was talking about the best, ca the best paid graduate placement they could get. And, you know, I was caught up in that. I was very much, you know, going to go off and do my CA and, you know, work in finance. Um, you wanted to do that? You, you were thinking well, this is a good yeah, route? It's, or it's, did it's, you? It's, it's tough to sort of think back to the mindset because that was definitely, you know, that, I was definitely giving that lip service. I was definitely talking about that for yeah. years. You know, that was what I was doing. That was the path I was on. You know, I'm very passionate now about working with young people at that age in particular. I mean, Heather, my big sister, works as an educational psychologist and her, her job is to work with people who are struggling in the education system, um, which is fantastic. I, I worry about the equal and opposite. I, wor I worry about the people who do brilliantly well through skill, school and, and higher education and then get fast-tracked into careers that they've not actually chosen to, to be in. So, um, so a few of the things I do, I mean, I'm, I work closely with the Saltire Foundation, Scottish Student Sport, I'm, I'm the rector at the University of Dundee. These roles I, I have for the, for, the, for the single motivation of trying to encourage young people to, you know, rather than just having a, a great education and then getting fast-tracked, to really pause and have the confidence to think about what they then choose to do. And I'd say not to be too intimidated by the five year, the 10 year, the 15 year, just to build a habit with, you know, it doesn't matter whether that's the world's largest corporation or, or playing your own fire the way, the way I do, but it's just feeling like you're in charge. Uh, and so that, that's more of a mindset than a skill set, in, in, in my mm. opinion. Did you see, sorry. That, period, uh, that was the most, sort of shaky period for you. Because, In what way? Tell us, tell us because, how. Because uh, his peers were all going off to get the job and, you know, the security and what have you. And you already had the plan, to, you know, to, to go off around the world, but it was, am I doing the right thing? That you, it, like you're saying, he was talking the talk, but, you know, there was definitely insecurities there. Um, when did you realise he meant business? He was going to make these things happen. It wasn't just talk. And I, he, he, he asked his sisters and I to join him for a meal and, and said, you know, before I get the job, I'm going to do this. Um, and I thought, great. And then he said, I'm going to go for a world record. And I thought, all right. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember that? Yeah, remember I, do, the conversation? I, do. I do. It was in Glasgow. It was a nice And I know nice I went Italian. very quiet. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I mean, to, to be fair, because I'd never raced, because I'd never done this professionally, um, I mean, I left Glasgow thinking I will, I want to go on one big adventure to end all adventures. This was not a career because I didn't realise you could, you know, it, it, it could be such a thing. Uh, it was simply the idea that I would sort of go out there and get out of my system. And then as I started researching and doing a lot into what had gone before, you know, hundreds, thousands of people have cycled around the world. But the proper circumnavigation against the clock was barely touched. Only five people had ever gone for it and the record stood at 276 days. And um, I, mean, I don't want to be disparaging about anyone that's gone 18,000 miles, but I thought 276 days was pretty slow. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and it's spoken so, like Mark Beaumont, yeah. And so, I, so it was only at that point that I thought, why is this not as coveted and professional as, say, the Round the World Sailing record? It should be. And I thought, my goodness, you know, despite being completely amateur at this, you know, I could, I could bag a record here. And rather than pipping a record, I thought, well, what's actually possible? And that's where I sort of really started planning that, that route and going well. I so the year was what, 2000 and... 2006. So I, I actually rode around the world the first time, 2007, okay. 2008. And the plan was 195 days. So that was 100 miles a day riding and then uh, some other days for flights and, and whatnot. So yeah, 195 days and we came home in 
194 days and 17 hours. So it was only really on the back of that and the BBC doc that we started to realize, hang on a second, you know, this has been a very personal ambition, a family project, which, you know, I could have the opportunity to go on and do more. You know, what were you thinking when he came back and it had been done? Did you think this is it then? This is the, tra the trajectory. This is what's going to happen with his life. He's going to be on a bike a lot. No, not at all. I mean, uh, like we said, it's just, it's just evolved in a way. Um, but, you know, to come back in that time, just to go back in the time, I mean, I cannot tell you how... Martin will say, you know, if you set a goal, that's what you'll, you'll achieve. But there are so many logistics and things that nearly don't go right and nearly don't, you know, don't happen. To come back within a few hours of the goal was absolutely incredible. I mean, it was interesting. I mean, I was trying to be as professional as I could, but I didn't really you know what I was doing. I, mean, I, was a, I was a good bike rider. I was going completely unsupported, so carrying all my own kit taking a really interesting route through the likes of Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, India, you know, police well, guards. Politically through. quite fraught as well for you, quite yeah. scary. Yeah, I mean, for, for, for me, I mean, I'll never replicate that first adventure, you know, mm. because people always ask me to compare them and I can't because, you know, the first time you, you know, go out of Europe and North America on your own, on a bike, you're sleeping under roads, you're under armed escort, you're, you're, you're exploring at your own pace. That is pretty exciting. You know, you're so naive, you're so wide-eyed about it. That, there's a, that, that first journey will always have a very, very special, special place. But I mean, before I, I mean, I'd really driven this to the start line and mum had very much been supporting me, but we weren't really working together at that point. It was just, you know, a mum and son relationship off the back of uni. And it was only really as I came to, to leaving from Paris that I sort of thought, my goodness, I need somebody, you know, to coordinate all this. You know, it's all in my head mm. and on this laptop. And so I, you know, mum came out to, to Paris and, I, and off I went and mum came home and literally had to learn how to turn on the laptop and write an email. Mum had never done that before. Right, take me back to that moment when suddenly uh, he goes, here, you have that, do something, uh, fix it all. What was on the shopping list to sort out? Can you remember? Well, I mean, I, I didn't even get these pointers, you know, I, <laughs> Just... I, 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 I shadowed him for the first few days to see how much he'd want to decant because on training rides he'd always sent stuff home because carrying too much and just to see you know mind and body how he settled in so I, I followed him sh shadowed to the yeah. Dutch German border and then um, cried buckets for half an hour and then thought right I've got to get back home and why were you crying what was making you cry I, I wanted to go too. <laughs> <laughs> no, did you know that? Did she to no, go? I didn't. No, I, I was I was quite focused on I, just cracking I, on. He was he was absolutely in the zone. I mean, that last time I saw him, you know, I I, I might as well not have been there. He was already in the zone, and uh, I thought, okay, I need to get out of here and get back home. And I just thought, all these border crossings, the first thing I have to do is get onto the embassies and make sure that border crossings are clear because I, I really didn't, you know, I, as Mark said, I hadn't been in on the setup really. He had a friend in Edinburgh who'd done the, the, the route and that was on the laptop, so I had to learn how to open the laptop. That's great. It was as basic as that. It really was. You didn't was. know how to open the laptop. No, no. So, so, I, so I, think, I, I think that's the danger when you look back to the man who cycled the world and the documentary and the book and everything that it became. It looks brilliantly sort of professional and polished, but, it, but it, <laughs> it wasn't. It was all in my head and on a laptop post-university, which then, you know, mum learned on the job. Mm. And, you know, things have gone to a slightly different scale these days. Ever so slightly, but, but did you not have to teach Una how to write an email? It was as simple as, you know, simple things like that that you had to sort I, of I got off the with. ferry, um, um, I got the ferry um, back home and went straight to my brother's in Kent and um, my nephew told me how to write an email and then I went on back up to Scotland the next day. And I'm much, be much better on the phone, so I got on the phone to the British Embassy and said, I need to set this up. <laughs> Did you know even how to, to form your thoughts to ask for what you needed permissions-wise? Were you, were you yeah, yeah, I had a pretty good idea. I, I had a pretty good idea what I needed to, you know, to happen. But of course, everybody would say, <laughs> "Will you put that in an email, please?" An email? No. <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, you've got to imagine over the last ten years. I mean, I might be out there doing it, but Mum's got this incredible network of friends around the world now who, you know, have 
helped, supported, you know, done incredible things, the friendship of strangers in many cases. Mm. And um, you'll find mum is very difficult to say no to. You know, whilst she might not be the quickest on a computer, you know, in terms of, in terms of you know, relationships and making sure that, you know, everything is absolutely put in place down the road. I mean, if we fast forward to the 80 days, I mean, there was 40 people involved in the project, probably, probably more if you, if you include absolutely everyone. And they all had brilliant skill sets and amazing life stories to get. Some of them are here tonight, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. And to you know, to 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 get all their amazing life stories to that point. But ultimately, you've still got you know, mum at base camp pulling pulling all the strings. And and one of the most important things I did, you know, before we set off on July the second this year, you know, I might have driven this project to the start line, but we had you know the logistics team, the the performance team, the media team was to absolutely hand over that leadership and say, you know, I'm not a decision maker on the road. Um, you, you know, you can't even look to me for moral support and camaraderie. I'm, I'm, I'm just riding the bike now. It's your job to get me around the world. So the lines of communication went very clearly from what I was doing to, you know, the buck stops with every single person we've selected for a reason. You know, so what a, a contrast fa in your mum's role. And, and, then, and then mum, you know, coordinating all that, which is amazing when you've got these, you know, media crews and performance teams and, and the rest of it. So, I mean, I think that's been... And, and to be fair, there's a level of patience there that I probably don't have, so I'm glad. <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> We've probably got to canter through quite a lot of your achievements because I do want to sort of concentrate on the, the Jill Verne 80 days thing and the yeah. whole excitement of that. But, you know, yeah. you did the Americas, uh, Tierra del Fuego, Anchorage to Tierra del Fuego. Yeah, yeah. nine-month pedal. And 13,080 miles of that, was it? Or was it more than that? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the whole idea there was I'd gone around the world choosing the flattest possible route a route from top to toe now down the, basically the spine of the Americas, the Rockies and the Andes top to toe, getting off the bike to crown it with its highest peak. So you've got Denali in the north and Aconcagua in the south. So they're two pretty big climbs and then, um, and then oh. sort of nine months of cycling. But yeah, you had additional energy to expend. Did you not do a bit of mountaineering as well? Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, uh, each, each, each climb was sort of three, three, three weeks. And I mean, that was, you know, that was certainly as an, a as an athlete, you know, pushing myself in a, in a, a new way, a different way, pretty, difficult team dynamics. And I, mean, I think we saw that again going into ocean rowing for a number of years. And um, yeah, yeah, well, I'm let's talk about that next. But I just want to know, you know, about that. What had you learned from your first foray in, you know, doing the around the world? Yeah. And what had you learned as well from that that made the next trip, the Americas, better? Well, I mean, the, 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 the Americas was on less of a, a race. It wasn't the first about it was about trying to be the first person to climb the two peaks within a single climbing season. So that gave me a time scale for it, but it wasn't world record pace. I had t more time to stop and, you know, capture stories. And, you know, it was a big BBC project. Actually, this was 2009, 2010. So it was just the birth of social media. And I can remember the team at PQ Pacific Key in Glasgow saying, can you not just film this journey at arm's length with this camera, but, you know, share the journey on this new thing called Twitter. And I remember saying, that's going to be such a waste of my time and it will never catch it'll on. It will never catch on. <laughs> and, and well, you know, you must have been thinking, well, this is great, something else to add to the list yeah. that I've got to learn. It yeah. just felt like such a nuisance when really what I was trying to do was make a great documentary. But I think for, for both of us, what's changed in terms of these journeys is, you know, not just doing it and the logistics and the incredible sort of creating a plan and then that period of performance, but is, is, is how you share that story, you know, with what has become, you know, a global audience. And, um, you know, that, as you well know, has changed beyond recognition in the last 10 years. I mean, the man who cycled the world we filmed on mini DV, that's tape, you know, that's oh. tape. Whereas obviously things are a bit smaller, lighter, faster now. What do you remember of the transition from that first outing and then what happened in the Americas, apart from the social media suddenly appearing from <laughs> nowhere? How well, did your job change? How did your attitude change? Well, I remember going into the BBC after he'd gone off and them saying, there's your desk. And I thought, really? <laughs> My own desk in the BBC? <laughs> but I did actually stay in base camp a lot. But they were wonderful to work with. It was really interesting to work with, you know, a big team that had been set up to support Mark as opposed to just me and to, to support him. And I do remember how much Mark enjoyed the virtual peloton um, through the social media. That, that really became a big part of yeah. it. Yeah, I, mean, I, I feel that. lucky to have, my career's bridged that gap. So I, I went on lots of adventures for myself. 
uh, and then you know captured them for audiences afterwards and then you know laterally it's all about that real-time journey but it completely changes your mindset on the road uh, do uh, you lose something because, because yeah. in a way mm. you think god no it's really important i get something out there's, of this and then suddenly you're thinking about three thousand other things you've got to do yeah i mean there's massive there's there's, there's, there's huge pluses and minuses with each I mean, it's absolutely fabulous having that opportunity to take people on a journey as it happens. I sure. absolutely love it. But, but I'd say I feel, I feel lucky because those starting their career now in adventure sports or expeditions, you know, won't maybe have the same understanding of what it's like just to go out there, you know, without any of that, without any ties. Yeah, the freedom. That's what you're talking about. I'm, I, I am remembering at the start of, because uh, the Americas was an in-house BBC project, um, the conversation where they felt like they had this sussed you know, they, they really knew how to, to run it all. And then it was only really as we sort of put the plan into action that they realized that, no, actually, mum was quite important to this. There was a whole load of stuff in terms of logistics and, and the expedition side of stuff, as opposed to the broadcast, which was uh, quite a unique skill set, which, which without any formal training, you know, mum had already built from, you know, 10, 12 years at that point. Um, but it's... It's hard, it's hard to put on a bit of paper, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. it's that network, it's the confidence, it's the, it's the decision-making process. It's also understanding how I operate and sort of, you know, when I'm out of comms or, you know, having a tough time on the road, just understanding what to do to support the journey. And how do you get through that when you feel that you're out of comms and you're very much on your own? Is that liberating or is it terrifying because you're now used to having that big support team with you and you, you can also speak to you now? Well, I mean, whilst there's a big support team back in the UK, I mean, these expeditions are still solo. What I found a challenge to begin with was going into the team expeditions on the road, be it the mountaineering or the ocean rowing, because, I mean, how should I describe it? I mean, when you're on your own expedition for long periods, for months at a time, it, you know, it gets incredibly tough at times, but you're living in your own head. You're interacting with strangers, which is, which is you know, wonderful, and it gives you a real sense of the places you're going through. But in terms of decision-making, you can't fall out with yourself too badly for too long, you know, it's you. Whereas when you're in a team and you know, you're on Denali and you're roped up the entire time for three weeks or you're pushing and pulling a boat 800 miles north of the Arctic Circle or rowing the Atlantic or any of these other things, you know, it's a very different, you know, I always think if you can't control the way you're thinking, you can't control the way you're communicating and then you certainly won't be in control of being an effective team member. But that's very different from just being on your own going, well, you know, I'm doing what I want to do. Mm. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, coming, you know, coming full circle back to being a solo athlete, but this time with a massive support team, both on the road and back here in Scotland, um, I think all that, all those team expeditions really, really helped. And I think quite often with the teams, there's been a real learning as to, you know, how, how we work together and how important it is. You know, I think when people initially tune into these journeys, they do quite often see it just as an athletic endeavor on the road. Yeah. You know, you miss the complexity in terms of, you know, the, the, the planning, the, the training, because as mum said, you know, you never do better than what you set out to do. So you've got to have a very clear plan. I mean, I think the romantic notion of expeditions is you set out and figure it out. You go out there and you just go, what am I capable of? What's possible? How are we going to do this? But no, no, no. All my That's expeditions have been sort of read off script, which maybe sounds a bit boring, but we know what we're going to do before we start. And then when you're in a tough moment physically and psychologically, you, you know what you need to do. It's not about figuring it out. So I think that, that sort of level of experience and the way to think about it is, is, is maybe different from what people imagine, but it's why I would say most of the expeditions have been either bang on target or failed entirely. And we have failed a number of times. Is it more complicated or easier when you're on terra firma and you can control things a bit more, but you've been on the high seas as well? That's a whole other ball game, isn't it, where you're bobbing about in yeah. the big blue. And we've got 20, 2011, you're on the Arctic expedition. Tell us about that time. Yeah, so I mean, this was a mission to try and take a rowing boat further north than anyone had ever gone before. I mean, we, we, we went to where the magnetic North Pole was back in 1996. Keep in mind the mag North Pole moves. Um, now, this was a point that had been walked to, it had been skied to. Um, a journey there wasn't particularly difficult from um, northern Canada through the Nunavut Territory, but to take a boat there would be a real bittersweet. I mean, it would be an incredible statement of how the world's changing. And what are we, six, seven years on now? Mm. You could sail up there every summer holidays. It would be easy to what we first did in 2011. So that was a big dock called Rowing the Arctic. I was put on board to film it, to capture it. 
um, but also to be an athlete. But as, a, as an ocean rower, I was a complete novice. So, I mean, that's an interesting place to learn to row a boat. Blimey. So what did you do to prepare for that then? I mean... A huge amount of training. And, I, you know, I was, I was commuting down to the south coast where the boat was and, you know, did a, did a you know, months and months and months of prep and training. But as I say, I had a strange sort of balance to, to strike on board because I had to be... When it's all hands on deck because you're in a situation like this pushing and pulling a boat through an ice field and that looks picture postcard but you know these leads through the ice are opening and closing with the currents and with it with the winds it's very, and you're beyond rescue in a situation like that you have to get back to to land to get pulled out of there so when you're you're very exposed but by, by that i mean if things go wrong um the consequences are likely to be very serious you know if i can, if i relate that to say a cycling expedition mm -hmm. where I would suggest things are far more, more likely to go wrong, but they're less likely to be as serious. So, I mean, you could say the same for high altitude mountaineering. You know, you're in a place where you get into difficulty, you've got to get yourself back out of there, which is a novice in the sport, but being there for another skill set, i.e. The, 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 the filming, is a, is a huge challenge. And, you know, I think that, you know, just sort of respecting the decision making when it's not the decision you would make. Well, that's an interesting thing because you're in a team suddenly and yeah. you've been used to being autonomous, albeit with a lot of support, but yeah. you've been looking after yourself. How did you psychologically adapt to that team dynamic? You're not the one giving orders. You're just part of the team. Was there a comfort in a way sometimes in sharing the practical problems with, with others? Well, I mean, I mean, take this, for example, or, or Ruin the Atlantic. I mean, Ruin the Atlantic came only three months after this. Um, because I wasn't the expert in any sense, either polar, ocean rowing, you know, or boats at all, um, I wasn't as involved in the decision-making process. Um, I was there for another skill set, you know, to capture the story. But, but when it's all hands on decks, things are going wrong, it's also the most important times to film. So, you know, being an athlete, but also having the objectivity to come back with a true story of what happened is, is, a, is a tricky balance. And having the trust of the team to... I mean, it's a real pressure cooker situation, ocean rowing. You see the best and the worst in people. I mean, the sleep deprivation, especially on the oceans, is incredible. You're going two hours on, two hours off, two hours on, two hours off for a month. So you never sleep for more than 90 minutes. Um, so to, to capture that story, you know, truthfully and to, you know, have the trust of the team, you know, you need to stay open to everyone. You need to, you need to listen more than you, you speak. And I think for somebody who had done so many solo expeditions, it was, it was a really useful thing to do. I wouldn't say it was easy. I found it really tough but I, I, had a, I had a very different role in these teams. I tended to find in crisis situations... And there were crisis situations. Yeah. You capsized, didn't you? Or yeah, that, was, oh. that would count, yes. <laughs> that's, quite, that's quite a crisis to me, yeah. Well, how did you deal with it? Well, I mean, you've got to explain. I mean, the mindset at that point was we thought we'd broken the record. You know, we were 28 days into rowing the Atlantic. We'd left Morocco and we were en route to Barbados. We thought we'd done it. We were about five days from the finish and we certainly weren't celebrating the, the finish, but I just couldn't wait to get back to dry land and, it, you know, physically and mentally, we were, we were pretty beaten up by that point. And then, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning, we went over and the boat stayed upside down. But... Um, and you're back at base and you know that things are happening or you, you're seeing this unfold. So I wasn't um, the base camp no, for that. But you're, you know uh, what's happened. But I, I, I was told, yeah. How yeah. did you find out that the boat had gone over? Um, so I had a call from the, the base camp lady, one, the, the, the wife of the, the skipper. <laughs> Um, you know, t to say that there was a May Day, um, but by that time, yeah, you know, there was some sort of um, word from them. So um, I think she'd had it worse than me because of th there was an unknown time for her before she contacted me. But um, did yeah. you feel because he was in the ocean? I mean, it's a completely different thing. That his life, his actual existence, was at much more risk than it had ever been before with anything. He'd done? Um, until that point, I was quite comfortable. Um, I knew he was finding it tough. I, I, I knew he had made the decision that, you know, life on the ocean wasn't for him um, b before this happened. Um, when I heard that there was a, a, a tanker on, the, on its way to, to pick them up, you know, I, it was just keep myself busy and, you know, just believe that's going to happen. Did it ever occur to you to say to him when you got him back, um, do you know what, enough, you're putting us through a heck of a lot? Never, it's never, no. never crossed my mind. Did honestly. you ever think, I'm mad? No, I mean, I mean statistically, ocean rowing's very safe, but when things go wrong... Um, I love this. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, if, 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 you're, if you probably analyse it, but it's, it's what I was saying before, you know, when things do go wrong, they tend to go very wrong. 
and we were 14 hours, you know, trying to, trying to be rescued. I mean, when you, when you go over like that, it's no sure thing you're going to be found. If we did nothing, we were literally waiting for a plane to fly out from Florida and do grid searches of the ocean, which is proper needle in a haystack stuff. So it meant swimming. Um, you know, we tethered our life raft on a 50 meter line with the upturned vessel so the, the riggers wouldn't puncture the life raft. And then swimming back and forth and diving underneath into the flooded cabin space to salvage the kit to be rescued. So, you know, your EPIRB, your sat phone, your VHF radio, all that kit, the flares. I mean, the first time I dived under there, it's very difficult opening your eyes in the salt water. It's a dark, claustrophobic, you know, flooded space. And um, I came to the surface holding the fire extinguisher, which uh, wasn't, wasn't much <laughs> That's good. That's really useful. Yeah. <laughs> How big is this boat? Just to give us an idea of what you're... Uh, you know. 11 metres. 11 metres, so, okay. Um, but yeah, I mean... I did find that because I'd done so many expeditions from a very early age, when things went really badly wrong, I, I tended to be somebody who got stuck in. You know, I, 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 I knew that I knew that I wouldn't, you know, I knew that I wouldn't sort of wait for other people to. And I think that's something that Nikki, my wife, and 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 mum, you know, have, have come to sort of understand and respect. That you know, I'm never I'm never going to sit back and sort of let things go wrong around me. Um, you, you know, and I think that comes from you know, having done so many solo expeditions and having the confidence to, you know, make, you know, just to think, well, the buck stops with me. Um, and certainly when it's a life-death situation like that, uh, it's pretty scary when you see people around you shutting down, mm. you know, just unable to cope. And it goes back to what I was saying before about, you know, if you, if you, if you can't think through a crisis, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're never going to be able to do what's necessary. But um, it's, it was fascinating going into what we've most recently done because, you know, such a big team dynamic, everyone out of their comfort zone, everyone pushing an ambition which a lot of people thought was impossible. And, um, you know, ultimately, you know, again, you see the best and the worst in people because you're so stretched. And just having, you know, 20 years of having done so many different things in different teams, um, you know, certainly not perfect. There are sides of my character that, you know, you see in these extreme situations that you don't particularly like. But I think that comes from having the ability to be, you know, pretty obsessed about what you're doing, you know, to understanding the consequences of your action and understanding the strength of the team around you. And um, you sort of look, you sort of, what I, what I struggle with now, because this is eight weeks back, is from, from the world, there's nothing that relates this reality to that reality. You know, when you're in that sort of performance mindset, it's, it's, it's pretty unique. Mm -hmm. And um, Laura Penhall, my performance manager, is in the audience tonight as our, some of, the, some of my other team, and, and you know, I think it's interesting to, to reflect you know, where I am mentally you know, whilst we're doing this, and the lines of communication that, that we have in terms of phoning home. I mean, I think Nikki, my wife, you know, quite often sort of says, look, you need to remember your mum and son as, as, well as, you know, as well as being sort of colleagues and teammates on these things, because you know, and now, of course, we've got two beautiful daughters, and Absolutely. it's a, a case of uh, being, being, being granny and being mum as well, but I think we're so good at just, being, uh, being focused on the task being in hand. In his own. But I'm just thinking about Benedict Allen, you know, the explorer. He went right off grid yeah. and he's a bit embarrassed about it. I was a bit angry because he was not ready to come out, apparently. He said he'd got a bit of malaria, but he was absolutely fine. But do you get that, you know, that there was no contact? He had no GPS, he had no nothing. He just disappeared into where he felt quite comfortable, the environment. And I suppose you're doing that mentally, but the other people have got to face the consequences of you not getting in, co in contact. Have you ever been out of comms and thought, this is a big problem when Mark's been on the road? Um, the first time um, in India and also in Australia, there were quite, a, you know, there were quite a few stretches. I mean, all we had was a brick and text. You know, we, we, you, we had no way of finding out in advance where the hotspots were. So the brick would whatever. be the GPS dot. So you could see a dot in the desert, but you wouldn't actually be able to speak to me for days on end. So, so, so there, there, there were a few stretches where, yeah, if you could follow the tracker, but we were out of comms. Um, and then the tracker battery died, so we were completely out of comms. There was no, no mobile nor, nor a tracker. Yeah. And, um, and how did that feel? Uh, well... You, I mean, it was what three or four days, so I think if it had been any longer, um, and we hadn't had something. That, as it was, his tent had been blown away because he'd, <laughs> <laughs> he'd um, yeah, been on sort of near a cliff, and you'd had a storm, and yeah, you'd, you'd had an interesting time. Yeah. I was, <laughs> I, I was Just fine. A bit. Blimey, we haven't even got time to, you did the Commonwealth Games, I think I spoke to you when I was doing my food yeah, yeah. programme for BBC Scotland, you were whizzing about doing all that, so you had kind of two years 
of kind of doing telly stuff. Was that good for you in retrospect? To have yeah, that I mean, gap? looking back, that sort of felt like a bit of a sabbatical as an athlete because I came back from the gap size in the Atlantic and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm done. Let's, let's have a rethink about what's next for now. I got married eight weeks later, which was um, not a knee-jerk reaction, but it was uh, what kind of happened straight after the world. And, you know, it was about family life. I went off and was a TV presenter for a couple of years, and I loved it. But the sum total of that and being involved in the 11 days sport in Glasgow was I'd been utterly inspired by all the hundreds of athletes I'd interviewed, but I was also jealous. Mm. You know, I couldn't take myself out of the equation. And I mean, as soon as the games were over, I sat down with, with, uh, with Yuna and with Nikki, and I said, look, if in 10 years' time the door's still open, I could go back to broadcasting. And uh, you know, I, I recognize how difficult an industry it is, but you know, it, it, I could do that. Whereas the only time to put all my cards on the table and to figure out what's the ultimate, you know, what, what's that personal best? I'd always felt like there was a compromise between the wild man element of, you know, where's my next meal, where am I going to sleep tonight, how we're going to get through, and the performance. I'd always been in a hurry. I'd be a rubbish nomadic traveler. So with all the journeys that I'd done, I always felt like there's more to give in terms of just straight up performance. And so I think when I sat down with the family, I said, look, well, I think what we negotiated was, you know, my older daughter's Harriet. By the time she goes to school, um, I probably need to have, you know, taken on these big ideas. So that gave me three years from that point. This is year three. Um, Funny that. And so... And I, and, I, and I said very clearly, if I'm going to come back to being an athlete, to being a bike rider, it's for one prize only, and that's, that's the world. You know, there's hundreds of great routes, but everything is small right. talk compared Ex to the world. Explain why it's so important. You're doing 80 days around the world in less than 80 days was the thing. You want yeah. Jules Verne inspired. It's massively romantic. You've got to be so confident you're going to do that. Otherwise, pfft. Well, I don't, I don't know about confident, but I mean, the... The, 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 the route I set 10 years ago was 194 days and 17 hours. I, I watched as that record was soon smashed and taken to a whole new level. Five or six people went faster. It w eventually ended up down at 123 days. Um, so these are not marginal gains. Massive leaps in performance. And, you know, bikes aren't that much better. Physically, we're, we're not much more able than we were 10 years ago. People simply believe they can do so much more. Now, there is a difference between how people are riding, you know, going more frame bags and ultralight as opposed to, you know, trekking, touring the way I did 10 years ago. But I did, I'd watched with awe and fascination as people had bettered what I did. And I always thought, like, I'd love to go back and once again take that to a whole new level. So year one was two years ago, and I, I wanted to do a, a big training ride, which to the public was a standalone event. And I chose the Cairo to Cape Town route, which is quite neatly a third of the world in terms of distance. It was 6,000 miles rather than... 18,000 miles, and um, so the record was 59 days for that, and um, uh, we brought it down to 41 days, 10 hours. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it went well, and that was, you know, that was year one, and I, I mean, if I was to go back to anywhere on the planet to explore more in a bicycle, I would be on, in Africa. I absolutely loved it, you know, the Sahara Desert, the Ethiopian Highlands, you know, the, 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 the great, you know, flatlands down through Kenya, Tanzania. I mean, Did it was you just, get the chance to, to talk to people and meet people and yeah, soak that up as well? Yes, because I, I was still unsupported. So I was still carrying my own kit on a bike quite similar to that. So a big difference, you know, carbon, electronic gears, hydraulic brakes. You know, it's a totally different setup to a decade ago. But off the back of, I mean, the wonderful thing about the speed of a bike is you're still completely tuned into the world around you. You know, people often say, don't you think you're missing the point of these journeys by going fast. And I, I argue the opposite. You know, we're so used to traveling to a place on work or on holiday and then comparing it with home. So we talk about differences. Oh, it's so different in this way and that. But if you, when I mean, I've been to what, 130 countries in the last 10 years, when I mean, you cycle across all these continents and, and borders, you get to see incremental changes, you know, in the culture and the geography and the people. And, and, and so that gives you the similarities. That, that, that sort of sews it all together in your, in your mind. And you get to see the world like a slideshow. So, so that, for me, is the magic of riding a bike. It's why I'm not a racer. It's why I love exploring mm. the world, although I'm always in a hurry. Yeah, you're going along at what kind of a lake? What speed well, are I mean, you doing? I, I even felt with Africa, that's the fastest I could go unsupported, and I was averaging about 160 miles a day. My, my excuse for that is there's a big section of dirt road in the middle. When they complete the tar from Cairo to Cape Town, I'm sure somebody will go a lot faster. Maybe you. But um, I always felt like... Even off the back of Africa, the only way to come back to the world, which was always the big plan, and do it properly. And that's when I took the decision, we need to get a, a, an absolute cracking support team. And this needs to be just about racing the bike. And it was a brutal, brutal challenge. Can you just explain what sort of physical condition you had to be in, what you were eating, what you had to do to train for this? 
So, I mean, the, the, the plan we put together last year was, um, you know, breaking down that 18,000 miles essentially into what was four hour blocks. Every day was 16 hours on the bike. Um, every day started at half past three in the morning on the bike at four. And you were riding four times four hour sets a day. Um, so get off the bike at half past nine, 10 o'clock at night. At times during the ride, we'd stretch it. You know, we'd be towards the end of each leg. So that was through to Beijing or across the end of Australia or the East Coast of America. By the time we were racing for a flight, we'd be doing more. We'd be doing 17, 18 hours a day. And you'd only be sleeping for three, four hours a night. But normally we targeted 16 hours a day riding, five hours a night sleep. And you've got that for, you know, two and a half months. Um, it's, it's relentless. And you're going to tell us how, well, you can show us how relentless that was and the toll it takes, can't you? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean I'd say it's, I, I, you can try and put it into words, but what we did, and some, many of you might have followed this, we did twice daily video diaries, and actually Nikki, my wife, stopped showing my four-year-old the morning videos because <laughs> apparently I'm a bit scary at half past three in the morning. <laughs> um, so I think we've got a little clip for well that. Well judge, okay, here we go. It's, uh, it's <laughs> Yeah, slept, slept deeply, but uh, only for just over four hours. So, um, woke a couple of times hearing the rain on the night. Uh, Laura's looked at the weather charts, and, the, uh, and um, it's quite a big storm coming this morning. Uh, you can feel the wind moving the motorhome, and it's right on the nose. So, looks like, Laura, what were you saying, 35? So... Yeah. Just shout it back. Yeah, so this morning, I've just been able to get the weather from, but um, the winds come around for like it's strong and warm. Yeah, so. Yes. So 25, 30 knots um, of headwind, sort of gusting. Um, obviously, yeah, pouring with rain. So, you know, I had a, quite a target today to, to get to the ferry. I'm just going to have to be sensible because. There's no point in beating myself up into that. Um, I'm just going to have to get out there and see what it's like and uh, ride sensibly. I'd be gutted to miss that ferry, but equally, <laughs> got to think of the big picture. There's no point in giving myself an injury or getting ill in it. So, um, yeah, I'll just get out there and see what it's like. I think by mid morning the wind's meant to come around slightly, but um, yeah, I think it's going to be pretty miserable either way. Well, I agree with your daughter. I think you, <laughs> you look absolutely wasted. Uh, you just weren't getting any sleep, but you just kept going. How do you feel when you look at that as well, you know, when you see him? I know you're, you're kind of used to it in a way, but he looks <laughs> so tough. dejected. Yeah, absolutely tough. And it was also tough for the film crew, um, you know, because they, they were getting even less sleep. And it, for everybody who set off, they, um, it was unknown territory, mentally and physically, although they were all professionals in their own and had, had done a certain amount of expedition work. To, to, it, it was a gruelling expedition. I mean, what, what I kind of sensed on the start line, we launched this project in April this year. We kept a, a really close secret until then. Um, pe you know, people knew I was planning something big, but I didn't say what. And uh, I, I launched it in April by immediately doing a training ride around the coastline of Britain, sort of uh, just about three, three, three and a half thousand miles mm -hmm. um, in about 14 days, 14 and a half days. So we live in a hilly island and um, it wasn't altogether a success. It was in terms of sort of launching the project and hundreds and hundreds of people came and rode with us and that roadside support, that camaraderie was brilliant. But in terms of a training ride for the world, it didn't give us all the confidence we needed because I only averaged 225 miles a day. Only. And I uh, finished with a hamstring injury. But the reality of the 80 day target is, I mean, we had 75 days riding, three days flight, two days contingency. And I mean, the margin of error is tiny. 240 miles is not a great day where you've got a tailwind, the sun is shining and you absolutely knock it out of the park. And just put it into perspective here, 240 miles is what? Give us a, a for instance from where to where. Um, we talking about this earlier. Perth to John O'Groats, here to, um, you could get into Wales. Every day. Every day for the next two and a half months. Imagine. So um, if, you, if you don't hit that target every single day, you're, you know, even, even in the first week, if we'd averaged 225, like we did on the Around Britain, we would have had to say goodbye to the 80 day dream. And I mean, the, 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 the conversation I had with many would be sponsors was, why, why obsess? Why call the whole project around the world in 80 days? 
why don't you just go out there and say you're trying to break the world record on the 123 days and then surprise everyone by going sub-80? Because if I'd come home, their argument was, if you come home in 81 days, you've obliterated the world record, but it looks like a failure. And so I guess what they were saying is, you know, why, you know, why, why risk your reputation? Why risk our reputation? What they're really saying. Um, on, <laughs> on, on, the, um, on the 80 days. I mean, and? I, I completely understood the media hook. I, I got the excitement around the 80 days. But I also truly believe that was possible. And, and when you're doing something at this level, um, I, 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 you, you have to read off script. I've said that before, but what I mean by that is you end up in a place physically and mentally where you're so pushed, you're so sort of depleted, you're so um, you know, focused on what you're doing. If you've given yourself an escape hatch, if you've given yourself a next best, a plan B, you know, you will... You will slip back to that at some point. You, you never do better than what you set out to do, so you have to have a very clear plan about what you're going to do. And, um, and it, it worked. You know, 16 hours a day at no, yeah, 15 miles an hour, which is, which is not fast. Um, you know, it's, it's steady, steady, 16 hours a day. If you can tick that off, but then you've got the logistics, then you've got the flights, the, you know, the, the, the border crossings, bureaucracy, this, the rest of it. This lady here is looking exactly. after all that. And actually, mum, mum sort of got a, quite a legendary status in the team because we'd be in all these time zones around the planet and um, you know they'd be messaging back all the time about all the issues and the planning and what was going on and I mean the sense was Una never slept you know did you sleep well she would message back at three four five in the morning so maybe she did but not at normal <laughs> times of the day what was keeping you going I, I don't I just get into the a mindset like Mark does you know as soon as as soon as it's go I just get into a mindset and I I, I just Keep going. You're on a parallel journey. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. 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 But yeah. something went wrong, didn't it? Nine days in, that was a bit. Yeah. I mean, it was a dream start. First six days through Europe, we flew through Europe. Great weather, westerly winds. My biggest worry, and that of Laura and the rest of the team, was that I'd get some repetitive strain injury off the start, like I did on the Around Britain. But I stayed injury free, and by by day eight, we were flying through um, Moscow. That was, I think, that was a 260 mile day. It rained overnight. Five o'clock in the morning on day nine. I went through what I thought was just sitting water on the road after the heavy rains in the dark, and it was a hole in the tar, and the, you know, the, the bike just stopped, and I hit the ground with the left-hand side of my face and my, my hand. And the, and the initial concern, I think we've got a photo of patching up afterwards, the initial concern was obviously this, because I had a loose tooth, mm -hmm. I had a, a broken tooth, and there was you know, blood and the rest of it. So that, that was the concern, and that's the upset. I got you know, in the RV and... Laura patched me up and I was back on the bike about 35 minutes later. Um, it was, a, it was only, only a 210 mile day that day. It was a, but um, but, but what, what, what was a bigger issue, which we didn't realise straight away, was, you know, I'd caught myself on, on you know, catch, caught, caught the fall with my hand. And what we thought was just a bit of a staved elbow or a bruised, a bruised elbow, you know, turned out to be something more serious. So um, there was a, a little crack in there and... Um, when you're riding 16 hours a day on rough roads through Russia, you, you know, I ended up riding really badly, I guess, for a number of weeks because, you know, I was just trying to protect the, the arm. But, I mean, it's in moments like that that, um, you know, the whole, the whole thing could end. Yep. You know, if it had been slightly more serious, you know, I crashed three times. We had a very serious ve vehicle accident which wrote off two vehicles in Australia. And it's in moments like that that you think, can I carry on? Will I carry on? How do I carry on? And you also, I think, gives the team a, a, a bit of a opportunity to think, you know, are we operating, you know, safely? We're on open roads. Um, it's worth it. It's professional. It's absolutely focused on performance. But ultimately, you know, it's fun. It's fragile. It, it's, but it is fun. I mean, at, at the end of the day, this is, this is not worth, you know, serious injury or, 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 or worse over. So, you know, we always sort of said, we're all going to be pushing ourselves so hard in each other. So we need to be looking out for each other. And, and, and I think people were really aware of that because, I mean, this, as I say, this is two and a half months. Mm. And, I mean, that level of sleep deprivation and performance is, you know, there's not, a, there's not a lot of examples of it. You said it was your Everest. It yes. proved something to you, which is really important. You, you, you said it was a line that had been drawn. Well, I also, I mean, I realise there's a, there's a much bigger part to it now. I mean, it, it's about the broadcast project is, you know, expensive. There's lots of sponsors involved. Um, but... At the heart of it is still a kid that wants to figure out how fast he is. And so, you know, I've always sort of gone back and we've had many a conversation over the years. Are we doing this for the right reasons? Is this the right project because it's what we want to do? Or, you know, is it just because that's the next thing telly wants or sponsors want or the rest of it? And we've always come back to, you know, 
this is, this, and there's always been a chronology. There's a reason we've gone from one to the other, even though for the public they've looked like standalone events. But everything, I, as I said, there was that sort of battle within me, feeling like there was something to prove. Really, what is that ultimate? And um, I've come back from the world, and um, I don't feel like I've got much to myself to prove anymore. I mean, I know this is only eight weeks later. People have asked lots of questions about, you know, is that your ultimate? Is that the ultimate? Will that record be broken? And I think that's fascinating, and I've talked about it a lot in the last eight weeks. And, you know, what I come down to is we got around the world in 78 days, 14 hours, and 40 minutes. The plan was 75 days riding, three days flights, two, day, two contingency. We just didn't need the whole contingency. So the romantic notion of pedaling around the world, like we said before, is just you figure it out, you go hell for leather, and you, 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 you find out what you're capable of. Uh, yes, of course we find out what we're capable of, but we wrote that script before we started. So, so one way of answering the question is, it absolutely feels like my ultimate. And I think a lot of my team would reflect it's the hardest they've been pushed as well. Um, and people, I mean, journalists have said things like, well, you crashed three times, you had serious storms, lots of bad luck happened. Get rid of all that and you could go a lot faster. And, 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 I, and I come back to this very simple thought. Yes, it feels like my ultimate. Yes, it feels like, you know, the culmination of three years incredibly hard work. But the honest truth is we did exactly what we said we would do. So we must have had as much good luck as bad luck. And the only way to really go faster is to have a different plan. And it won't be me. I'm not going around the world a third time. But I mean, I'm, well, I'm, say that. I'm fascinated by the psychology of it. I'm fascinated by, you know, just when people perform at those levels, you know, bring incredible skill sets to bear on a project which takes everyone out of their comfort zone. Mm. And it I mean, can be achieved. Yeah, I mean, this is not just about performance. This is about sharing the story. I mean, we've got the guys from you know, Michael Media in the audience. We've got quite a few sponsors based here in Edinburgh who, who are with as well, um, Edinburgh Airport and, and other partners who many of you will know. And they, they, they were all, as I say, a, a part of this big prize. But um, for anyone who got on board at the start line, there was a belief. You know, everyone was backing my belief that this was possible. And I sensed on the start line that even though people were believing in the plan and what I was uh, capable of, people were still more worried about possible failure than they were excited about imminent success. Nobody was there in the 2nd of July this year going, we've got this, let's go, Paris, we, you know, let's bring this home. Everyone was suitably um, intimidated by the, by, by the task ahead. And for, for me personally, that's an interesting psychological journey because even though I sort of handed over leadership to my team, I still felt like it was for me to prove. For all these amazing people and all the working parts, mm. I'm the one that's got to turn the pedals. And on the start line, and some of my team have actually said this to me since, Alex, my uh, mechanic, great buddy of mine, he said when we got to Beijing, he said, I wasn't sure this was possible. And he now believed, I mean, nobody was honest enough to say that on the start line. But um, <laughs> I can't... Brave enough. I can't, I can't decide what's, what's a stranger sort of feeling at the heart of a project. To be on the start line and for everyone to be working incredibly hard around you, but to to know from the body language, to sense from, because you know, I'd say the Round Britain hadn't been a perfect plan, to sense the nerves and to sense the, you know, the, 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 not the fear of failure, but the, the, the fact that a hell of a lot could go wrong mm -hmm. and um, there was a real mountain to climb here. And then I got about halfway around the world, I would say. Uh, the first month I broke the world record for the most miles ever cycled in a month. And I think that gave the whole team a real confidence, you know, just over 7,000 miles. And um, we got to Australia and we, we all felt there was sort of a, a a complete turning of the tide, you know, not just with the, the team, but with the media, the social media. Everyone was starting to talk about it as if it was a done deal. You know, we've, we've, we've proven it over 9,000 miles and we just need to continue working the plan. And, and at the heart of a project, I can't, maybe I've not had time to think about it enough, I can't decide what's a, a stranger sensation. Being at the heart of a project which everyone is wondering whether it's possible, or being at the heart of a project which everyone thinks a done deal and you've mm. still got 9,000 miles to go. They're, they're kind of equally slightly lonely places to be. And I, I mean, I was given wonderful support from my team around me, but I still felt that real um, responsibility, you know, of everyone else's expectations. Gosh, we're so, we, we're hurtling towards the finishing line. In fact, I've overshot the runway, I'm terribly sorry. Marshall's gonna come in with a big crook and pull us off the stage <laughs> in a second, but brief fire, rapid fire questions. Any rituals or talisman that you take with you on any of these trips? I'm not sentimental at all, much to, the, much to the frustration of um, 
uh, people around me. But um, Yuna gave me a, a I don't know what, what you call it. A, a, a tiger eye. Tiger a eye. lucky stone, I guess. Uh, uh, Mum can explain it better than me. And I carried it in my back pocket all the way around the world. Wonderful. So that's gone around the world. Is there a sense of loss when you've achieved something, like especially what happened with the Artemis Challenge? I mean, it's an extraordinary thing, but I, I, I've spoken to astronauts and people that come down to Earth again. And <laughs> they, just, they just say a bit of them still there. Do you feel that? I mean, I certainly don't wish to be on the road anymore. Um, it was pretty painful. The, um, but I've definitely had moments in the last couple of months where you feel slightly ungrateful because I've pulled off my biggest dream. I've been supported by an incredible team and you feel quite blue and empty about it. You know, I couldn't be more busy with family life, with, with the media and with everything else that's going on, but you've lost that singular focus. You know, when you talk to an Olympian, whether they've won or lost, and when you come back, you know, you come off the back of a, 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 you know, what has been at the heart of your existence for a very, very long time. So it's, you know, whatever that normality is when you come home is, 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 is strange to readjust to. And it's also very strange when everyone else is pulling backflips around you. Everyone else is so excited about what you have done and you're not maybe feeling the same emotions and you feel slightly silly for not, not sharing it. You know, you think, well, you know, you should be celebrating most of all. There's a deep sense of satisfaction. You know, there's a, a, a real sense of pride in, in what we all pulled off. But, but, but for me at the heart of it, um, I think I struggle to connect, I said it before, this to that. And now I just signed the, the book deal today. I've got the opportunity to, you know, bury away and, and try and remember it all. And I think, I think and I, I, haven't written, I haven't written books before. I think that's the one time I get to really go back and relive it and appreciate what happened out and there. And actually process it. And process it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Because it's such a momentum all the time. There's no reflecting while you're there. It's, I mean, that, that, that's always the rest of it. I might write it once, but mum has to read these books about 15 times before they hit the shelves. So. <laughs> you're the proofreader. And just very finally, that, that philosophy of constantly pushing yourself uh, a bit, that translates to everyday life, doesn't it? We're all here tonight, and these are Innovation Nation uh, lectures that are free. I think it's a brilliant idea, I would say that, but I must say, I think it's wonderful to hear inspirational people. Do you feel, Mark, that there will be people sitting in this audience that might think, well, I'm not gonna get on a bike and do what you've done. There's no way I can do that, but we can all push ourselves further than we think, but we've just got to go for it and try it. Yeah, I mean, I always, I always think, there's a massive difference between being, you know, technically good at what you do and having the, I guess it's the leadership quality in yourself to, you know, grow beyond that. You know, so, somebody said to me very early in my career, aspire to be paid for who you are rather than what you do. So that's the simple idea that you grow beyond your technical ability. You know, we might be good at the nuts and bolts, we might go to all the courses and have a great education, but, 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 but really sort of defining that in our own terms is about, is about taking on things we're interested in, um, you know, applying that passion and getting other people to, you know, you know, create a community around what you're doing. So I mean, that, that could be absolutely anything. But I think, I think a lot of people are held back by their education. I think a lot of people think it's just about being good at what you do. Whereas actually, you know, I think the freedom comes from, uh, as I say, fi finding where that can take you and finding people that share the idea. But I mean, let's be honest about this. You know, I've not made it. You know, none of us who ever stand on the Innovation Nation stage have, have made it. You know, we're all riddled with the same insecurities and, and doubts and the fear of failure as everyone else. And, and that's a very powerful thing, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's, letting that, it's letting that sort of push you on as opposed to hold you back. Mm. Well, time to end our chat. It's been absolutely wonderful having the two of you. I'm glad I strong-armed you into coming along. This is brilliant. And the bike as well here with us. A great 360 degrees look at Mark's life and challenges. Really appreciate you both doing this together. It's a big arena. It's so generous of you both to share your, your memories and your insights. And I'd like to thank you both on behalf of everyone here at the EICC tonight and the bike as well for coming along <laughs> and talking to us and inspiring us. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Bowman and his mother, Yuna.